Welcome back to the 1090 Podcast. Today's episode, well, we're here with Jana White, and it's a brutal story, as usual, with the 1090 Podcast, and I'm going to start with reading Jana White's parents' obituary. Um, And I know I'm not a great reader, so please work with me here. All right, here we go. Oh, man, these, some of these names at the beginning. Issel. It's a weird last Issel. name. <laughs> Alana L. Ubel Issel. 1949 to 2014. 1949. Think of all this, man, all the stuff he saw. Or she saw. Herbert Hubert R. Issel. 1943, 2014. All right, here we go. Buckle up. Alana and Hubert died instantly from a tragic UTV accident while camping with their family over Memorial Day weekend. Alana was born to Thelma and Fred on December 1949 in Canada. Yep. Dang. Canadian. Uh, Hubert, what's his nickname? I saw it earlier. Somewhere. Hugh. Hugh, Hugh. Go by yeah. Hugh. Yeah, he hated the Hubert name. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, Hugh. Here we go. I'll fix yep. it. Hugh and Elena were married on February 8th of 1973 and sealed for time and all eternity on September 16th of 1983. They had been parents from the beginning and continued to be devoted parents, grandparents, and great-grandparents every day of their lives. Hugh fell in love with Utah when attending Utah State University. He came back when he was stationed in Utah after serving in Vietnam. He loved the outdoors and loved to share those experiences with his family. He was retired from Geneva Steel, but continued to be actively involved as a consultant for various companies. He also spent many hours as a temple worker. And that, for our listeners that don't know, that's like mm-hmm. a pretty cool, uh, sacred thing in the LDS church. Like very, I don't even like very... Like they're giving up their time and energy. It's for free. And so that's like a big thing for in that in that world. He was survived. Uh, hold on. I think I think we're good. And then so we you came up to me. I was speaking at Utah Tech. Yep. And then you came up and and you're like, Do you remember me? And you were my high school psychology teacher. What a small, crazy world small that is. Small world, yeah. And you also, what else did you do at West Jordan High School? So I coached cross country. I'd help coach track. Yeah. And taught psychology and class, like class officers, student government stuff. What a, on a scale of one to 10, how difficult of a student was I? <laughs> <laughs> Briggs had you checked in in line. So, yeah, I you know, terrifying. play basketball. You had to be pretty good. What's and you're still teaching? At cor- I'm still teaching I'm at, at Corner, Corner Canyon. Canyon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's your favorite thing about being a teacher? Mm, the students' relationships with the students. It's They're by far. Fun. It's by far the best. Yeah. Thing. What's the worst part? Uh, the parents. No. The grading. Parents no, I think parents. Second, but yeah, that's a good yeah. answer. I feel like when I went to high school, like if the teacher got mad at you. The parents like backed up the teacher. Right. Like, what are you right. doing? Yeah. In Miss White's class. Yeah. And now it's like, what's Mrs. White doing? Why yeah. why are you students a... golden? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's what happened, man? Yeah. Participation but, um, trophy era is what happened. Yeah. Why uh you just always wanted to be a teacher? I love I love teachers. No, I, I wanted to be a psychologist. I was going to school to be a therapist. I wanted to work in the mental hospitals. I was gung-ho until I did my hours in the mental hospital. And I couldn't separate being there and their stories and feeling bad. I got to leave and they were stuck and yeah. why. Uh, it, was, it, it was a drain. And so I'd always taught. I'd worked at a water park. I taught lifeguarding. I had taught swimming. I taught ice skating. I thought, oh, I'll teach about psychology. This is a good thing to know. So yeah, I, I love psychology. Yeah. Yeah, and then I became a psychology teacher at West Jordan High School. So there you go. I uh, know. After and, I left. Yeah. Yeah, there was one guy in between. There was one between. Mm-hmm. And, and he was a great guy, too. I forget his name now. Yeah, I can't remember. But I remember this kind of sums up my teaching. Mm-hmm. And I haven't. I taught for five years. So how long have you been teaching? 25. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. so you're time. like. 
old. So just take this for what it's worth. You, I mean, yeah. you know better than me. But I, you can probably relate to this a little bit. But I like planned all night for this lesson, mm-hmm. and I thought like, I'm gonna change some lives tomorrow. Like this is good. Yeah. And I don't even remember what it was, but like I remember like I stayed up late. I was telling Courtney about it. Like, this is gonna be good. So, like, we get to school, and I'm crushing this. Like, it's mm-hmm. going perfect. Like, I'm hitting all this. Sp- like, it's great. And then a kid raises his hand. And I'm like, here we go. Like, <laughs> it's happening. Yeah. Changing lives. And the kid, I call him the kid. He's like, can I go to the bathroom? Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <It's> like. <laughs> That's about. Oh. Yeah. I think some good comments coming. Yeah. Good like, discussion. Yeah. Because you don't do it for the money. You do no, it because no. you, you know, like yeah. you want to really make a difference here. And then you get that and you're just like, oh, that just. Yep. You're so like, yeah, oh, Brandon. I'm doing good today. Yeah. You can go to the bathroom, Brandon. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, you um, And we hope to have a good episode today. Welcome back to the 1090 Podcast. Life's 10%. What happens to you and 90% what you're going to do about it. We're here with Jaina White. And I uh, brutal story, of course. Yeah. Um, it's your episode today. And I don't want to put too much pressure on you. But where would you like to start with your story today? Where would you like me to start? I'd like to start a little bit before the accident, just paint the picture of family life or what things were like. Okay. And then maybe we can get to the day of. Yeah. If that's okay with you. Yeah. I'm just grew up in Utah, grew up doing stuff. My dad, we always four wheeler we're four wheeler riding, three wheeler riding. We'd explore yeah. in the mountains, hike, go to old ghost towns, old mines. We just grew up doing stuff. And as I got older, married, had kids, I was raised, I raised triathlons and I was coaching, teaching. Um, when I had kids and kind of stepped back from serious racing, my husband and I bought a side by side because hey, we could take the kids and do some cool stuff, go explore. Yeah, especially in Utah, yeah, it's always. Oh yeah, great places, and right. we love San Rafael Swell. There's cool areas, yeah. great things to go see. So you're not just riding; you go and see something and come back. And so we had started doing that with family. We'd get together on weekends and holidays, just had general ones we'd do. And my dad would go. He'd drive his big green machine four-wheeler. He could ride up anything. The grandkids would ride with him. He'd teach the grandkids how to ride. We'd get somewhere. All the guns would come out. He'd have everyone target shooting. You know, it's just— Did you ever get into the clay pigeons, like, pull? Oh, my brother, clay pigeons. No, my dad and I target shoot. We'd go hike, and we'd pick out something, and we'd have just a little twenty-two and see who could hit the branch, who could hit something first. I mean, everything came out, the whole arsenal, but Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so just fun. You know, he loved the desert. He loved the West. He was from Ohio. Okay. And so he loved it out here. And my mom, same thing. She loved it. She was a good sport. How many siblings did you have? I just have an older brother and sister. And where were you? I'm the last. I'm the youngest. Me too. The baby's always... Mm -hmm. The spoiled brat. Yeah. 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 They they get all the good stuff. Yep. Got what you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And so... That's just how we grew up. And so we did that with our kids, and we just had this tradition. We had this big group that would usually go, and we would always go on these different places. And we kind of had different places we went on different holidays. And it was Memorial Day weekend. It was my husband's birthday that weekend. We always go out on Memorial Day. Well, most of our group wasn't going. We decided to go swell. My parents were like, yeah, we're going to come. They hook up. And so we were just doing the normal things we'd always done. And we'd picked a ride one day, and we were doing this big loop. And what uh? What year is this? This is twenty in twenty fourteen. Two thousand fourteen. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep, May two thousand fourteen was May twenty fifth on my husband's birthday, and we had gone down through um, Eagle Canyon. There's a big arch. There's Swayze's cabin. You go by. Came up on the other side of I seventy. We explored down some other finger, and we decided to come back a route that we couldn't go a few years prior because it had been washed out. We thought, well, we'll go and see if it's washed out from the other side, and if not, you know, we'll go through, and if it mm-hmm. if it is, we'll turn around. We just wanted to see. It's kind of the ugly part of the swell. And so we'd gone over there, and we went and checked it out, scouted it out. And it was good. People had been through. You could get through. And we were always super cautious riders, and so especially with kids, when you have kids in tow. And so we had gone down in the canyon at the bottom of Eagle Canyon. And coming out, there was a hill that was kind of steep and loose rocks. And we all get out. You stack the few rocks. My husband goes up. My dad goes up. 
And I had talked to him. I said, God, Dad, there's something. Why is your machine? Like, why is it slipping in these rocks? And he's like, no, no, even pressure. I mean, my dad knew how to ride. He taught people how to ride. He'd get people's yeah. machines out of hard areas. He could just go right up. And we all get back in, and we get all the kids seat belted, strapped in, helmets on, and we're heading back to camp. I'm like, all right, going up this four-wheel drive road, we're back to camp. And as we start heading up, it's literally just a, within two, three minutes of starting back. We go up this one little hill, and as we got to the top, it was the last little hill out. And you we, were ahead of him, We right? were ahead, and I had my six-year-old son in the back, and my parents were behind us with my eight-year-old so son and my how niece. many kids do you have? I have two boys. Two boys. I have a stepdaughter who's older, and she's you know gone at this point, and I have my, my two younger boys. Cool. And my eight-year-old's with my dad in the side-by-side. My dad had... Got rid of his four-wheeler, Cooper, and he got in the side-by-side. He was so excited. More comfortable than a four-wheeler. This is yeah. great, right? M- my son, Blue, he loves his grandparents, Trent Marsh. Mm-hmm. They have a side-by-side. He yeah. Loves it. It's great. It's his favorite thing. Oh, yeah. So cool. And so, and my niece's daughter was in the back. And so, they're strapped in. They have the big harnesses, helmets. Off we are. We get up this one little hill, and we turn around to look to make sure they were coming behind us because we just kind of started. And after this, everyone knew the way back. And I watched him come up to the hill, and I watched my dad's vehicle kind of stop, and it did these two hops to the right. And I thought, that's really weird. And he turns the wheel, and I know my dad to, like, roll back and reposition. And as he turned the wheel, it just flipped on its side. And it shouldn't have flipped on its side. You would think it would go back, and it flipped sideways. I was like, oh, no. No one has—my dad has never rolled something like this. The kids have never rolled. My mom, they're going to be upset— It was literally this hill that, I don't know, 15 feet high hill, 15, 20 feet, just nothing. And reading your story, you've been up and down this path many times that We had been down, up and down it with a big group before. Right, yeah. I had driven up it, inexperienced people, it was nothing. You went up there on Friday and this was like on a, like you've been up. It's on on a Sunday. Yeah, like you've been a couple days riding. Yeah, we'd been riding, we'd been to all these places and. So I see him rolling. I'm like, oh, no, they're going to roll, and they're going to stop right below. I'm like, oh, everyone's going to be so upset, my son, my niece, my mom. I'm like, oh, dear. So I take off running back to, like, help. And when I got to the edge and I looked over, um, you just saw this trail of dust and debris that was like this 30-yard arc, and it went off this cliff. And at the top of the cliff, you see my son's helmet just sitting on the edge. And I was like, you have, there's just, I don't even know how you describe what that's like and just took off running. I don't know what was coming out of my mouth at that point. If I was screaming, it's like like the world was quiet. I didn't even hear the vehicle rolling. And you go to the side of the cliff and you look over and they're sitting upright at the bottom of about an 80 to hundred foot cliff. And my son is sitting outside of the vehicle and everyone else is inside. And at that moment, you think they're all gone, right? So you, I mean, you were walking over there thinking, like, they just tipped over. Mm-hmm. And, you know, like, no big bit deal, yeah. basically. Yeah, a few and rolls then, are going to be upset. Right. And then now you're like, my life's different. Like, It's just, you don't even, I don't even, I don't even know. You don't even know. It. You don't even know. Mm-mm. How, and then, like, so how did you even get down there? Like, what's it, like, Well, it was down where the trail had come from earlier. We'd come down the canyon and then come up this ridge. And so. Sorry, I just have so many questions. Yeah. Um. Cooper, mm-hmm. he's he's sitting out. He's unconscious, or I think he's. I look over. He he's laying. Dead. I think he's dead. My husband you, thinks he's dead. You think everyone's before dead. I know it. My husband's there. My six year old son is at the cliff. My husband's yelling, "He's dead!" Right. My six year old has no idea. You know what to process. He just sees everyone at the bottom. It's just like it went so bad so fast. So like, fast. We were fun, laughing a few minutes yeah, before. Yeah, fun family ride, yeah. and now like. And just terror. Something, you know, we had been in Moab um, in April at, at Jeep Safari, and we're four-wheeling with some friends. And we were on a trail where we got out of the Jeep. My husband just drove it. And we're looking over this edge, and there was a car winch down in there. And the guy was telling us the story that it was this father and son who had gone over, and one of them had died, and this horrible thing. And I'm like, I can't imagine. And all of a sudden, it was just so foreboding that six weeks later, I'm looking over this cliff going, I can imagine. Like, did did you have that thought when you're? Yeah, all of a sudden I went, oh my gosh. Yeah. So when I got the phone call about my, I had a buddy, Wayne Ott, Ott die, maybe like a week, I don't know, two weeks before Mm -hmm. car accident with my family. And I kid you not, like, I remember falling to the ground thinking of Wayne. And I remember telling myself, like, it's my turn. Cause I remember leaving, I remember leaving Wayne's funeral, like, 
I can't because you just you see can't his, shake it. You just see his kids and his wife, and you're like, and I'm driving home to my kids and wife, and I'm like, mm-hmm. I just can't even go there. Like I can't even imagine it. And then two weeks later, here I yep. was. And so that's so that means a lot to me that you had that thought about that other person in that moment. Cause I had a very similar experience yeah. about, yeah, like this is what it, it's happening to me now. It was a weird moment because leading up to it, we were supposed to be doing involved in this event and leaving our kids with people and leading up to it, the, the th- about three months before my parents were 64 and 70. My husband, my, my dad was working for my husband at an optical lab he owns, just helping him out. My dad was production management. He's like, oh, let me come help you get that running. So he was stopping by all the time for dinner, back and forth. My mom would come up all the time. They were such a part of our lives, playing with my kids, hiking days. Yeah. And as they were getting old, I just started getting worried. I'm like, they're kind of old. I mean, that's really not that old. They're in perfect health and everything. But I started worrying about them driving. I would walk out in the driveway. I would hug them, tell them I loved them. My kids would want to, one more time, we want to, okay, play tag one more time. It's past bedtime. Okay. Something was just weird. Something was unsettled. And this thing we were supposed to do, and we're supposed to leave my kids with my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, so we're going to watch them. And I just, something was just unsettled the whole time, these months leading up. And not only when I looked over, I thought, oh my gosh, I know. And I went, oh my gosh. This is... This is what. This is why I was feeling all of that yeah. stuff. I like, knew I wasn't going to be doing this. Thing. I just don't even know how to describe it. It was the strangest moment. And then I looked at my husband and said, do you have cell phone service? Call 911. And I just took off running. I had to run all the way back down and back in. And in that moment, I can't even just, I mean, I'm pretty controlled, level-headed. I'd worked as an EMT at the water park. I'd worked as an EMT for eight years. I'd resuscitated people. I'm pretty calm and staying controlled in situations. I had no practice. This is your family. family. This is off a cliff. So does all that go out the window in that moment? or No, actually, you know, I don't even know how to describe it. You know, if you grow up with any kind of religious belief, it all gets challenged in that one moment, but it all comes out in that one moment, too. I took off running. I was. I could feel. Wait, hold myself. on. I really love what you just said mm-hmm. right there. Can you just, can you say that again slowly? Yeah. When you bring when you're when you're raised with religious beliefs, it, it you have them. But when something like that happens, it comes up, but it comes out, and you start to second guess everything. But they also come out in that moment of what you decide to do, what who you turn to, what you say. Like, yeah. you really start to know where where your real belief is. Yeah, like, and what are you gonna do? And is, yeah. I don't, I don't even know how to just, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it other than I took off running, and I just, I screamed. I'm not a screamer. I don't get real upset. I don't get real. Just screamed, yelled, mad to God. God, I need a miracle. I said, I need a miracle right now. Then I gave a qualifier. I said, but only if he's gonna be okay. Don't keep him here for my sake. My head knew my parents were gonna die or be dead. The age of them, the nature of the accident. I knew, I guessed what they died from. I already knew what it was going to be. As you're walking up on the As I'm, as I'm running is... down that thing, I knew they were going to be gone. Okay. There was nothing. If that happened outside of a hospital, there's nothing you can do to save them. The force of that impact do you t- think, rips your heart off, you know? Do you think you, and I'm just, do you think you maybe had that clarity so you could just be focused on... Cooper when he got My there. brain is just logical. I'm just a, I just go okay, through yeah. these things. And whether it's that training, whether it's something else, but I was out of control. I'm screaming this and I'm running and I'm in a panic and I can hear myself. I can hear myself crying, yeah. hear myself screaming. Yeah, is it um, wetting myself? Like it's ugly. Kind of out of body in a way. Like right. Yeah. Cause for me, it was like, oh, I'm making that sound. Yes. Because part of me is like, what does that sound like? Oh, that's yes. me. Then now yes. I remember like what? Like just mm-hmm. Yeah. It's unreal. It's an unreal But for me, like, I I just got a phone call. You're, like, in the – you're in this thing. Mm -hmm. So the PTSD and the – this is a whole different level. Like, I didn't see it happen, and then I'm not running up on the scene. Yeah. it's. I don't know if it's worse to see it or imagine what it was looking like. I don't know. I have no idea. I don't know if it matters either, but, like, no one (sighs) – Let's just keep going. So you're, yeah. you're walking up. So I'm running. Scene, running. I'm running like crazy. I hit the bottom and I realized how out of control I am. And I just started yelling at myself. I said, you've got to get it under control. You've got to yeah, get it under control. You're this split. is going to be bad. Part of you is in control. Part of you is in control. Like, right. And then the other part is out of mm-hmm. control. 
And I kept, I just ran down this canyon and it took a hot minute to get back down there. And I ran down the canyon as I came around the corner, something clicked. People ask me, I'm like, well, it wasn't me. It helps that I had the training, but it wasn't me. I'm like, somewhere there's a higher power took over because I was a mess. And I went right into EMT mode, calm, collected. Even when air med finally, they were shaking and I was the one making the calls, which is weird. So I went up to who was going to be easiest, my dad and my parents. I knew they were going to be gone. I you felt said his hands. You went up who was going to be easiest? easiest to assess, to triage. Okay. Yeah. So I grabbed my dad's hand, it ice cold, gone. Grabbed my mom's, cool but not cold. She didn't die for about 45 minutes. A few moments of her talking. Really? Oh, yeah. So I feel her. And do, you I'm like, mind, oh. can we, do you mind sharing that at all? Or is that just. Too- yeah, no, it's, I mean, it's fine. Right. I, she didn't respond right away. I go to my niece. She was talking, moving. Her helmet had broken on impact. Um, her face was lacerated from the top of her forehead down and just hanging. And she's pinned. So I'm talking to her, assessing. And then as I go over, my son was sitting behind the driver's side. And when we think, since we didn't see when it hit on impact, we don't know. There's so many unknowns that we know, don't know. There was hair and scalp on the bottom of the vehicle. But there was no sign on anyone else. We don't know where it came from. My son tumbled. He must have broken impact. The seatbelt broke. He had horrible lacerations and bruising, looked terrible, but was outside of the vehicle behind it laying on the ground. Helmet on the top got caught on something, had ripped off of his face. We don't know what it was. As he's laying there and I'm going to touch him, he sat up kind of confused and dazed. And then immediately then I knew, okay, he's alive, this, he's moving. I'm seeing legs and parts moving, and I saw his face just swelling. It was just like a football, just huge swelling, this impact. It was shattered, completely shattered on his left side. So I sat him up and laid him down on his right side, grabbed my dad's camera bag that had fallen out under there, put it as a pillow. And at that moment, then you go, now what do I do? So as I'm calling up to my husband, who's talking to 911, I said, two two gone, one going, and then a second who's injured. They're calling out three helicopters. I'm like, no, we only need two helicopters. And so they pinned us, and they were coming, but it took about 45 minutes for them to get there. They came out of Moab. So in the meantime, my cute little six-year-old, poor kid, is down at the top being brave with the phone so they don't lose connection, we don't lose service. I have to have my husband come down really quick to help me unpin my niece because I couldn't do that on my own, get her out, lay her down. I laid her close to me in the sun, so she could, so she wouldn't look at things because she kept asking me if it was a bad dream. And I'm like, no, honey, I'm sorry. It's not a bad dream. Hold still, hold still, hold still. I, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I just need a little clarification. Yeah. So it's your mom and dad, your son. And my niece's daughter. And your niece's mm-hmm. daughter. Yeah. Okay. So sorry. Yeah. Go. They're okay. And so as I'm sitting down there and then I go, I have to stay with my son because he's trying to, he's trying to go out. And when you have a brain injury like that, I'm like, that's the worst thing that can happen. Cause they might not. No, you're like, not going to wake up. Either, you're not going to respond. Dead. So I keep sternal rubbing him so that he would wake up and he would just cough out tons of fluid, tons of blood. I'm putting him on my leg and checking for cerebral spinal fluid in his brain, nothing coming out of the ear, but just so much blood and fluid coming out of his mouth. Uh, are you crying hysterical still? No, or you're, I am. You're, Calm right now. Come on, Coop. Come on, Coop. You got Unbelievable this. that you Stay can this. watch your kid do that and your parents and your mom's right. saying this, and you're just My able. mom would reach up and she would help, oh. help. And at one point I had my son calm and everybody went up to her and I was just talking from behind. I went up to her and I rubbed her arm, grabbed her hand, rubbed her arm. And I said, mom, mom, I totally lied. The kids are okay. Help is coming. Hold still. Just don't move. I love you. We all love you. Okay. Put her hand down. And then back to your... And then back to my son. Sternal rub, sternal rub, sternal rub. At the end of about the 40, 45 minutes, I started getting a little panicky. Where are they? Because it's harder to keep him awake. It's hard. He's he's crashing. And I'm just like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I, I feel myself kind of start to shake. And then I hear the helicopter. And the first helicopter, I don't know how he did it. He came in. He landed straight down in that canyon on a flat rock, the only one. It was amazing. And you cover and sand is going where and it's a chaotic scene, right? And it's about the same time he landed, the ground crews are coming, search and rescue. All these search and rescue volunteers are hitting up top. I'm a little ignorant of those guys because I'm focused down here. And as soon as those medics come around and they see, they start panicking. 
trying to, who do we triage? Who do we triage? And I can hear they're talking. And I just stopped him. I said, list first, second, going, gone. Right here. Like you're telling these, mm-hmm. you're like telling yep. them. Which, which, the amount of time you saved them probably. Well, they had never been, They, I, you know, I, ironically, if we fast forward several weeks, um, we met them all again. There was a race we because we raced triathlons. You met the first responders. Yeah, and we had signed up for this triathlon down in San Rafael Swell, and we didn't know it was Search and Rescue's fundraiser. Our, our friend runs a wilderness program for youth down there, and so he'd put it on to help them because they always respond to him in different yeah. situations. And we finally convinced us to sign up for this race. It's in July. We usually go to Bear Lake. We're like, all right, we'll give up a boating weekend. We'll come down. So we had signed up months before. And after this had all happened, people are like, you going to race? I'm like, I am not going to race. That's the last thing I want to do. And they said, well, it's the search. It's the same guys who responded to you. We're like, we're coming oh, down. Wow. And they, they're such great people. We've I, become friends with them. They're I, such great people. I just love that so much because I'm a big believer of showing up. Mm-hmm. Like, because just with grief and other people, right. you, you never really know what to say. And you, there's nothing to say, but you can show up. Yeah. And if, I mean, obviously, they showed up for you. And the, I just think it's so cool that you had no business of going. And rightfully so. Like, why right. would you even be interested in that in that moment? But when you learned it, what it was for, it was like, well, it changes absolutely everything. Yeah. And we went down and, and the same up. flight crew came in. All the search and rescue over yeah. there came in. They saw Cooper. He was out of the hospital by then. Mm. And people were just crying. Yeah. And then that's when they told me. They said, we were a mess. We, we fought for him because you were in such control and we don't know how. When Cooper, sorry, just to go uh-huh. back, but when you're you're doing the the chest mm-hmm. rubs with Cooper, um, what are the thoughts going through your mind? Like I'm I'm gonna lose him, or I'm just or, stay you, awake, just stay you, awake. I'm so not even thinking losing not a, him. It's just like this is all I can do. This not a whole lot of thing. thoughts, really. Like no, that. I know everything I need. I don't have it. I don't have an EMT pack. I can't open his airway. I can't give him oxygen, but I can. I can keep you from going to sleep. I can keep that fluid coming out so it doesn't fill your lungs and you yeah. die. Right? And, and then so that's your the niece focus. too. She was, you know, she had this horrendous injury. I was picking all the stuff out and I was like, I can't even wash that out. That's like, no. She had a broke, they both had the same broken elbow and she had it, the equivalent of an ACL, but she didn't have the brain injury he had because her helmet broke on impact where his came off. Right. His head took full force. So he had sharing throughout. So when they, you know, the guy was freaking out. He's like, I can't backboard. I'm like, I can backboard. So I crawled under. I backboard the end. We get him out. They get him on the backboard. And as soon as you turn him, it's like game over if you don't hurry. Because now he can't throw it up. It's going in his lungs. And I just like, okay, mouthpiece. I'm like, where's the bag? I'm bagging my son. I said, the girl's getting the mouthpiece out shaking. And she goes to try. And because it's so crushed, she's having the hardest time getting that in. And I'm counting. And she tries to make Kate time to bag again, and I'm bagging him. And I'm intentionally bagging more to put air in his stomach to force him to throw up, right? To try and avoid trying to get as much fluid out as I can. And the guy is saying, I'm like, I know, right? And by the third time she's trying, we're going through this process. She's thinking, I can't do it. I can't do it. I said, yes, you can. Try again. And I was like, in my head, I'm like, and if you don't get it, I'm taking complete, oh, I'm, I'm getting it in, right? <laughs> Yeah. I am getting it in. And so she got it in and then we're just go, go, go. And we're running and just throwing them on this helicopter. And it's a tiny helicopter. She looks at me. I'm like, no, go. You are leaving me. Go. And they emergency, they had emergency pit stops. They take off. They had emergency pit stop in Provo. They could not get the tube down. He's crashing. They have to surgically innovate. They take off again, get to primaries. And at that point, just a team of doctors racing around him for hours. And they start calling us, where are you? Why aren't you here? Get here. He's crashing. Why aren't you here? They have organ donor people outside, people around. They finally came out. My sister-in-law was there um, and a neighbor. So here's the, the religious part. I had a neighbor. You know, So we go through. If I back up, we go through. They had ground crews while we were going to the helicopter had pulled my mom out to do CPR. And I see that in my side view. And I know, well, she's gone now. Because your your heart rips off your chest cavity wall and you slowly you're bleeding out. And as soon as you move, it bleeds out and you're done, yeah. which is good. It's not painful. It's this confusing death. And so we take him off on the helicopter and as I turn around for a minute, I see the scene before me and I kind of process it on the on the other side. And my husband's standing there. There's the sheriff's wife with my son up above. He's down there and I see him. And I just remember grabbing him and I was, and I had that shaking, crying, freak out moment. They're dead, they're dead, they're all dead, they're, you know. And then I looked at my niece and, okay, got to go back. 
And as I'm passing my mom, they're doing CPR, and I stopped. And I went over to him, and I said, you can stop. She's gone. This is going to do anything. They looked at me, sure. I said, yeah. And I covered her up, and I tucked the sheet. And then I went over to my niece, told her that she's going to be okay. A second helicopter had to land up high, couldn't go down below. But we had time with her, so we had to pack her up. I was telling her, people are going to be there. This is safe. Everything's good. And we start walking her up. Your niece, you were confident that, my she'd, niece's li- daughter. that mm-hmm. she'd live? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because she was talking. She was fine. She wasn't bleeding. She had none of the so like out of, life-threatening out of the injury. Group, she was the, the... Out of the two boys. Yeah, the two kids. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And my dad was covered. And for whatever, I had presence of mind. His wallet's here. His keys are there. We need to get these things, which is just, in my brain, it's kind of weird. And they were like, how? And I said, I don't know. I don't know. And so we go through the process, and they have to drive us out. And, Can I ask? I just uh-huh. have another question. And yeah. It's such an obvious question, but um, like an obvious answer, I think. But like right. when you're, you have to cover the sheet of your own mom. Right. Weird, what, right? What? Or are you still in so much shock still? No, they'd cut, co- you know, covered her. We're over. I'm dealing with stuff. I feel a breeze come through, and I look over, and it blows up. And I went over and just said goodbye and covered yeah. her, you know? And I think it's more of just out of respect, something you catch. It's, it's just, I don't know. My brain knew, you know, as soon as I looked over that cliff. But my brain also knew, what would they want? They'd want me to take care of those kids. Don't be super upset over them. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know. Just go into a different place. I think it's like the a very dark, um, terrible example of like you. You really have to like learn in your life to like Mm -hmm. okay to cut like to let some things like if you have spent so much time in different areas, Mm -hmm. you may have lost. Another person. You have two choices in that moment. And these are like the toughest decisions mm-hmm. a human has to make. Like you are, it, and time is ticking here. Right. And so you have to make very hard decisions very quickly. And those type of decisions, if the outcome doesn't end up well, ruins people the rest of their life. Right. And you have to, in that split second, do what you can do or react to the situation. And if you react, you're hysterical. And we had moments of that. Yeah. But if you just go into that total reaction, you you don't take control of what you can control. And it doesn't mean it's going to be the best outcome, but it's the only chance you have to make a difference, if there's a chance to make a difference. Right? And my brain just kind of went, you either got to do what you can do, or you have that reaction where you're non-functional. How long did it take you to get to the hospital to see Cooper? Hours. Hours. We're in the middle out there on an ATV road. Once we get up, the sheriff is driving us out this ATV road. I don't think that suburban will ever be the same. I heard bumpers and things crunching everywhere. Yeah. I mean, they were flying. And we got to 70, and he used over 100 back to the campsite to get us to our car. And those guys were amazing. They're amazing individuals. They, they treat every search and rescue as kind of a calling. Like, they're there to help. They're there, you know, because no one else will be. And so they cleaned up everything. They sent us on our way. I ran into our camping trailer, and I looked down for a brief second, and I just saw what I was covered in. And I grabbed clothes. I stripped those off. I put them off, and we took off. And as we're driving down I-70 again, they called ahead because nobody pulled us over. We're driving 100. We're flying. We're coming up past Monroe to Price. We're about to hit Highway 6, mm-hmm. right? No reception in there. The hospital's calling us like crazy. Why aren't you here? Why aren't you here? Why aren't you here? Like, what do you we want me to say? Coming. Like, what do you We are yeah, hours like, away because he's crashing. We stopped off at Burger. Like, what uh-huh. do you think we're doing? I know. Like, we're coming. Because he's dying. He's dying. My son yeah. is dying. And they've been working for hours, and there's no luck. Nothing's happening. There's nothing they can do. And so as I'm driving, and I I can't think, I text my boss, my principal. I'm like, I can't even think the subs. I'm not going to be at work. I just say, here's what's happened. You know, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. You can't, there's certain things you can't process. As much as I could process and help with what I could help, certain things I couldn't even think of. And I have a neighbor who, the, the spiritual side, said, once upon a time, she told me she had this friend, gift of healing, LDS religion, like this guy, blessings, has this gift of healing. And I thought, well, where was that? A few years prior, I'd broken my back, had it fused. I'm like, well, where was that when I broke my back? Like, yeah. seriously? God. You know, well, you held out on me. I text her. I have the thought to text her. I said, hey, here's, here's what's happened. 
I need him to go to the hospital. If he's in town, I need him to go to the hospital. I need him to get a blessing to my son. That's the only chance he's got right now. I know how mad he is. And that's all I could think. She texts me back. He's here. They're on their way. I told my sister-in-law when she called us. I said, that's the guy. When he gets there, let him go in. And that was it. And as the doctors came out to um, sit, come in and say their goodbyes, have family come, whoever's there, come say their goodbyes. This is it. He's crashing. We cannot keep him alive anymore. So they come in. Kids have, you have five units of blood. Cooper had, they had replaced three units of blood in him at that point. Right? Usually yeah. you're a vegetable, you're brain dead, you don't make it. Yeah. They came in and he came to the hospital as soon as they came out. They walked in, he does that, and Coop stabilizes. And the doctor stood there and the organ donor people stood there and just said, We don't know. We get they call us right before we get into Highway Six and they said, He stabilized, get here in one piece. And as you drive through that canyon, my husband's over there, you know, breathing frantically in this state of shock. It, my kid's whole life is flashing before my eyes, and I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like, what do you do? You're just in this state of shock. This really happened? Did the, is, This is fake. This isn't real. Yeah, like, I'm going to wake up yep. any moment yep. now. Yep, yep. That's how I've waited for for a while, yeah. Right. You're in that state of denial. And yeah. teaching psychology, think exactly. of the stages of grief That's, and death and dying. Well, Denial's the first stage. I don't know if you had this being a psychology teacher, mm -hmm. but I taught the stages of grief. Oh, yeah. And then... When yeah. I went through them, I'm like, oh, wait I a did, second. I did not teach that very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. Because I kind of taught it as like, like a ladder, and then you get to yeah. acceptance. I'm like, oh, like it's acceptance on Monday and then not on Thursday. Like it's just, a, no, it's, it's not, up and down. It's left and year. Right. It's, I think it's years in some of these cases. In my case, yeah. it was years. It was years. For sure. And that denial part, you know, we get to the hospital and we finally get there. It's dark. It's late at night. My husband drops me off in emergency. He has to go and try and park a truck up there somewhere. I run in. I tell him who I am. They're like, hey, we're going to send somebody down. I run into the bathroom at that point, And I look up and I'm covered in dirt and blood. And I'm trying to wash my hands, wash my face. I go out there. They Like the shock kind of wearing off. It's kind I mean, of, it's you just not, like you like, looked at yourself for right, a second. Yeah, like, you're like, whoa, that. I don't even recognize what I'm looking at. And they come down and get me, and we walk up through this maze up to where he is in the Picchio. And as soon as I saw him hooked to everything, in my brain at that moment, I said, okay, it's out of my hands. This is a God moment, and yeah, I don't know. here I am. Yeah, I've done all I could do at this point. Everything's hooked up. I just have to but sit like, and wait. Like, seriously, though, like how you handled that moment. No. Probably, I mean... Time was of the essence. Sounds no. like just made it there. Like it was about, I mean, right. doctors right. said, come say your goodbyes. Mm -hmm. Like what? Uh, like just good job to know. you. You're just there. You're there. Because there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee he's going to make it. I know brain injury. I know exactly the side. It's your left side and language. And then there's and, a fear like, okay, even if he lives, like what type? Yeah, what's like, he going to be? He Can he gonna, talk? Right? Can he understand what's spoken to when him? What's those, his functioning going to be? When those fears start to yeah. Was that right away or was it just? No, I just sat there. I sat there. There were so many people there. People had come out from everywhere. And I didn't realize people did this. I didn't realize when someone happened. People were showing up from my neighborhood at 2.30 yeah. in the morning Very at the cool. hospital. Right? And you just, yeah. at that point, by 2.30, I couldn't say anything. I'd see him. I'd just talk him. I'd start crying. Like, I don't even know what to tell you. Yeah, you're and exhausted. then you're just telling the story again because you don't know what else to do. And when my husband came up with my six-year-old son, had seen it all. My neighbor came out and said, don't let him see him. It's bad. It's bad. I'm like, the last time he saw him, he was looking yeah. over a cliff thinking he was dead. He needs to see him. He's hooked up and he's not dead. Yeah. And when they finally left at 2.30 in the morning and people started to, you know, people at 3, 4 in the morning, people started to, you know, go away. And I'm sit and so I'm the one sitting there. My husband took my son home. And I'm sitting there in this room with a nurse that he's so bad, the nurse just sits there and watches him 24-7, never turns his back to him, doesn't eat in the room, doesn't anything. And if he needs to go to the bathroom, another nurse comes in and stands and watches everything, or they go and they switch off. And I went, I didn't know you did this. I had no, like, I realized how bad he was. And you'd sit there, and if you closed your eyes, I don't know if you got this, it just replayed, everything replayed. You couldn't close your eyes. Yeah. You couldn't fall asleep. It wasn't until you're so exhausted you pass out. I remember yeah. the first few nights, Blue would just, he'd want to take a bath all the time. Mm. Like, let's take a bath. And so we, I just remember sitting, just swimming trunks on, just sitting in a bath a lot. Mm -hmm. And he'd want to do it 
middle of the night, like 3 a.m., like trying to take a bath. And I still don't really know why, but I'm not even sure why I remember why I even started bringing this up. But like, yeah, you're just trying to process this. You can't fall mm-hmm. asleep. And then when you do fall asleep, you don't want to sleep because you might just dream about them and then you have mm-hmm. to wake up from that dream. And that now you're reality. just like, mm-hmm. okay. And it's, let me ask you this, back to the stages of grief. Yeah. And this probably doesn't make any sense because it's not how it works, but just maybe so we can talk about it. Like if you had to break it into into percentages. So you have acceptance, depression, anger, bargaining, denial, mm-hmm. which is like the five main ones. Like, let me go first, and maybe this yeah. rough example will help you be able to try to answer this question. But I'd say, like, the first year for me, I was probably like 80% grief or 80% shock, mm-hmm. sadness, depression, all those other things, obviously there. Yeah. But I think th- the big one is just shock and maybe denial. Mm-hmm. And then that kind of. St- I think second year that probably dropped to like 30% shock and more other emotions like anger Mm -hmm. and depression. This happened for you. This happened, what, 2014? Yeah, 10 years ago this year. 10 years ago this year. So like how is your grief, if we want to use it in these stages, like Mm -hmm. percentage-wise, like I I don't know if I'm making sense, but like, how much of you was in shock? How much of you was in anger? How much of you... 10 years later? Yeah, or maybe just throughout, <laughs> like, from year one to now. Just uh, walk me through, like, the evolution of your grief a little bit. You know, bit. that first year, end of the school year, happens on my husband's birthday. Next year, we just ignored his birthday. Oh and my, we just pretended yeah. it didn't happen on his birthday. But um, that first year, I think because I had to focus so much on my son that was injured and my six-year-old who had seen it. And I was over my parents' estate and two funerals. I was in a state of denial the most time, like because I kept going to call them. I kept thinking I heard them coming into the room. Man, I kept. I had this right. People would walk in the room, and I think it was Courtney. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'd see her face yep. on them, yep. like Court, and it's and then yep. it's like oh, or oh man, I remember that yep. phase very well. It's so weird. Or someone calls you, it's probably Courtney. Yeah, like, no, or go to call him. I picked him. I oh, threw my phone. How go many to times text in the her. Car, like. I, what am and I doing? And then you just want to throw your yep. phone and scream at the world. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So luckily, I think for me, the whole reason sanity held together is because I was focused on him. Is Surgeries and therapy and testing. Yeah, so it's kind of like you're staying so busy. That was mm-hmm. kind of your method of denial. Yeah. Like, and and it's, so, it's very much present in your day-to-day right. life. But in a big way, it's still kind of denial. Like, I'm just going to stay super busy and try not to yeah. think about it as much. You focused on them. The, you, we had to face it as we went through the first week. And you just, I couldn't focus on a lot. But focused on him, writing the doctors, everything that's going on. And as we are prepping for this funeral, two people's funerals, you're, you're going through this thing and doing all this stuff and trying to find wills and... You know, because they die so suddenly. And luckily, when my dad had worked in Greece, he worked at Geneva still, and then he got hunted by this company in Greece. And he'd worked over there. And so when he was there, I had done banking for him. And so luckily, I knew a lot of stuff of where things were. But you're finding all that stuff out. And people are flying in for this funeral, and they have to go to the medical examiner because of an accident and the nature. And so it's a little delayed. And as people are flying in, I finally hit, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. And at that point, they come, my aunt, he had, my dad had one sister, best friends, they're super close. And as they fly in and I'm out in the waiting room talking to him, they come running down the hall and said, Cooper's awake. He's speaking. And that was a huge concern. So I race down there and I come in and his whole face is still swollen. He has his one little eye looking out. And they said, do you know who your mom is? And his little eye looks over at me. That was a big concern. So he could understand. I'm like, that's still intact because that was injured. Yeah. Can you say it? And he could speak. And so it was like a wave of relief. Wow. He can understand, he can speak, and all just big hug, and I'm crying. At that point, and then I'm like, okay, I can do this. We, we pass that hurdle. And as we stand in a funeral, as you remember, people come from everywhere when it's a tragedy. Yeah. You know, three-hour line at a viewing, just constant yeah. people lines. And that night when it was over, and I turned around, I looked at these two caskets, I dropped on my knees. I mean, there's moments. So even though in your denial, there's that moments of overwhelming grief where you just want to tap out. You're like, I yeah. can't do this. I mean, there's moments where like 
and I like, I feel like like bring it on. I'm taking on the whole world. Yeah, like let's go. And then yeah. the next day, like I can't do anything, and I just want right. to die, and I'm done. Right. And it goes back to you have the two choices every yeah. time. Just like down below, do what you can do or react, and that doesn't do any good. Right. You can feel sorry for yourself. You can react to it. You can wallow in it. But it's not going to change it, and it's not going to improve anything at that moment. Yeah. And my brain just had to keep going back to that. The next day we have the funeral, right? We go through the whole thing. I did speak at my parents' funeral. Yeah. That was, oof, right? That was hard. That took a lot when I get up there. I thought I was going to fall down. I had to wait. But a lot of people had questions. A lot of people wanted to know stuff. Eked her way through the funeral, then back at the hospital. You couldn't even grieve the funeral because you were back at the hospital dealing with brain injuries and facial reconstruction and all these things. We didn't even know his nerves got pulled out of his neck going down his arm from his spine until weeks later. And then we're dealing with nerve graft surgery, trying to get his arm to work. Besides, you know, we're so focused on the brain and the face and reconstruction and he had shearing throughout his brain. There's so the grief going through the process for me was, I think, so delayed because he went through nine different surgeries. He went through hundreds of hours of therapy. And so in that, my focus went from that denial as I kept going to call them or having dreams that they hadn't died. And I'm like, look, see, look, your house is all clean. I knew you weren't here. I didn't oh, touch you. Man. Like, you ha- the, deni- the dreams kind of haunt you that they're really not dead. They're going to call them, they're thinking about them, thinking you film walk in. Um, that part is weird, but mine, I think, was delayed with the grief moments. I'd be doing laundry. I'd fall to the ground just sobbing. It would hit you at these random moments. But you get back up, and you just get back yeah, at we had stuff. we had a guest on named Kimberly, and mm-hmm. she said, she's like, I think grief kind of comes in waves because yeah. if if it didn't come in waves, it just drown you. Like, yeah. you, you just crush you. So, it like, would. it kind of just – and I think there's a lot of truth to that. I think that's what right. you're saying. And then, Jana, I love – I love, I mean, brutal story, but I, one thing I love about your story is you have this moment and you've mm-hmm. said it many times, but you've had this moment, like you see him go over the edge and you're emo- like you see it and your emotions, yeah. like you're screaming and you're crying and you have that, you have to have this internal battle with yourself because no. it's completely natural that you have these emotions, but then you kind of have to talk to these emotions and be like, Hey, like we have to put you aside and I have to yeah. deal with my parents and yeah. I have to deal with Cooper. And I, and I think that moment of that battle with those emotions, that is how it is every day. That's how it's yeah. always been. Actually, nothing's yeah. actually changed. Our world is always that, though. Are we going to yeah. do something about it, or are we going right. to like, do it? Right, and like, like you had Regardless to go, you had to go bury going. your parents, and then your son went to the hospital. But like, really, like that battle has never ended for you. No, and that was maybe like the beginning of it, or maybe the most intense version of it. But in a very real way, you're right. fighting that same battle when you wake up today. Like yeah. you have this overwhelming emotion of anger, sadness. Probably, I'm just guessing, yeah. but you overcome that with what you can do and all those things. Right. And that's why I love stoicism is it's perfectly natural to be sad and angry and upset oh, yeah. and mourn, but don't let your emotions control you. Right. It's natural to feel them, but don't let them control you. And I feel like if you would have let your emotions control you in that moment, sound, I don't know for sure, but it sounds like there's a good chance you would have yeah. lost your son too. Yep. And I think that's just a very dark, but, beautiful analogy for grief in general of how it works Mm -hmm. like and that's how it's worked for me like not a lot has actually changed since the moment i got that phone call still very broken trying to figure it out i've just got it's just like practice with anything else the more you do it the better you get at it and i've gotten better at handling these emotions but that's the daily battle that i'm in a lot is trying to like have a productive day and not let these other emotions Mm -hmm when yeah. yeah it's learning how to work with them they become part of you my biggest thing is i didn't want it to define me i didn't want this to yeah. change me and that's what you're defined by it's part of you right. it does change you it changes your perspective changes I mean, your as outlook. it should yeah it does you can't get rid of that but <clears throat> i didn't want it to be the excuse of not living of yeah. not doing of not moving on and here i have these two kids and i'm like you have to be okay right, right. you have to be okay I'll be okay eventually. You have to be okay. This is a big thing to handle at this age, right? Yeah. How are you, you going to get through this? And you do go through denial. I remember when anger hit. 
And I'll, and someone warned me. They had lost a lot of family members. And they said, you're going to be angry at a soccer game when you see grandparents there and your parents aren't there. You're going to be angry when you see family get-togethers and it's not your family. So angry. And I I was like, no, I'll be fine. No, I'll be fine. And my little six-year-old has a soccer game. We're trying to keep life normal for him. We were trying to do little hikes and little things between all the doctor's appointments. We're just trying to keep normalcy. And we're there. And sure enough, I see some grandparents there. I'm so mad. And I don't get, I was, I hated the feeling. I hated the And you're not, you're not stage. like mad at them. You're just. Of you're, what you've lost. Yeah. You're just what mad at. What you've had at, and lost. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You're kind of mad at the future you missed, that you thought you for what you sure had. What you missing. Yeah. What you're missing. What you thought. Yes. Like you're just mad. And people gave me a lot of books and I started going through books and I finally came across the neuro a book written by a neurosurgeon who has a near-death experience and just talking. I think I had questioned every religious belief. Even though in the beginning, I yelled at God. Even though I saw, yep, you stabilized. His brain didn't swell the next day. The doctor was shocked. He goes, I've never seen this. He had no bruises on his body. He tumbled. His he helmet enough, fell off. His helmet fell off. Not a single bruise on his body. The doctors kept looking him over every day of the week. Are you kidding me? He went, what? He did what? There's no bruises? I'm all, none. Yeah. Don't ask me. I can't explain it. And even in all these situations, I kept questioning, is it true? Is it really true? Is it this? Is it that? right? And something about reading this book by this neurosurgeon who is totally agnostic, who is totally science-based, has this experience and has an experience like we had been taught of being in this brain-dead condition, but having this whole afterlife type experience before it comes back mm-hmm. and then writing about it. Somewhere in my brain, I thought, okay, why am I questioning myself? Maybe, maybe we're good. It's okay. The right? It's really, yeah. I don't know. It challenged every belief I had ever had. Really challenged it. And so as I'm going through, okay, denial, anger, bargaining. Yeah, I bargained all the time. Had the horrible thoughts. If we wouldn't have gone camping, if we wouldn't have, oh, gone, man. if we would have picked a different trip, haunted by those thoughts. If we would have turned around. The what again, if thoughts? They will eat you alive. No. They will take your whole day. Mm -hmm. They will, yeah. I almost think that would what would drive me off the edge, over the grief and the sadness. Is that yeah? If I could have done something, I should have stopped something. I should have protected them. I should have double checked things. I should have, should have, should have, would have, could have. Both my husband and I had that was. But isn't it funny how like it was rough? We have these thoughts, but it's not like what, or at least for me too. But you don't get mad at. Other people for what they could no. have done. It's just you. It's you. Yeah. You can, Why do you so, think we're that such is? a harsh critics of yeah, ourselves? Like you're not mad at anyone else. Yeah. And you could be like, why didn't you? But it's just right. you. And that's I struggle with that too. Like yep. yeah, all the things I could have done. So yeah. hard. Yeah. So hard. And I think that haunted me for years until my son was older. And part of what we got was therapy dogs. Got a little indoor Whoa. dog for my youngest kid after a few years and things had gone. What were down, the dogs? We, names? we have Giz, Gizmo, Giz. He's a Yorkie Poo. Gizmo. And then we have an outside Catahoula named Coda. We got him from Coda Crumb Basin. Aww. We actually had another one, but he got sick and died in the middle of this. This is my Cooper's dog. And I was like, I gotta find another dog. This is his <laughs> dog. I know if it's a bad day or a good day. You know, I was on KSL. I was next day, we we're driving to Coda Crumb four hours away to pick out a puppy. I'm like, what am I doing? But the good thing was, is I told these boys, I said, when we get dogs, we are walking them every day. They have to be walked. They have to be taken care of. And it was such a huge catalyst of coming through this. i mad I waited that long. To get the dogs? To get just, the dogs yeah. and walk them every day. Because when we would walk, we have a different experience. My youngest son had to go through, my six-year-old went through six months of therapy for PTSD. Cooper, at a point when he finally broke down crying after all these surgeries and everything, broke down crying. He went through six months with PTSD. You know, my husband and I'm swimming one day trying to do some normalcy or go for a mountain bike ride. We'd always trained and raced so much. And I hear a helicopter go overhead. I'm off the oh. side of the trail and it's full blown. PTSD. Oh, horrid. Man. I'm swimming one day. A thought just crosses my mind. Swimming hard. All of a sudden I'm doggy paddling. I'm about to drown in the middle of the swimming pool. And, and my coach is you- looking at me like, are you okay? And I'm and, like, no. And I just have yeah. to flee. I just have to run. So we went, and ours was pretty easy, EMDR therapy. We did three yeah. sessions. Good. It helped release that. Uh, but it, you, as you're, you're just going through this, and it's just different. It's just different. And it was a long process. And so you're going through the bargaining thing. And finally, we were walking a few years later, and we're talking. 
And in that, I was you cross over. It's not like you go from one to the other and the other one stops. Right. They kind of molt, but they do. It's for me. They yeah. kind of came in an order on top of each other. And I think I had a low grade depression for about four years. And I asked the guy one time in the PTSD therapy, I'm like, when's the bottom going to fall out? When am I going to not be functional? Because this is not normal. And he just looked at me, he goes, if you, have, if, you're, if you haven't hit rock bottom yet, you're going to be fine. I said, I don't feel fine. I'm a morning person. I used to wake up excited for the day. Like, hey, what's, whatever was going on, college, all right, let's go get this stuff done. Yeah. Let's move on. Let's go do something fun. I'm just a morning person, just ready to go. And I wake up and I'd be like, oh. And I'd go slog through a workout. Because I know I'm supposed to do it. But I can't go fast. I can't push into that zone. You know, as an athlete, you push into that zone of kind of pain or death. You yeah. know, pushing yourself. Fight or fight. Type yeah. Of Working hard. These speed workouts can't do it. Pull back. There's no motivation. No. And you get up and do it. But I can't even. Even What's if I try point? and push, I can't. Like, I'm in preservation mode. Yeah. Right? And I ask him that. And he's like, well, you're changed. You're not going to go back to that person who wakes up excited. And I went, what? Are you kidding? He goes, no. Do you know what you just experienced? He goes, it's, it's changed you. It will always have changed you. And I was like, well, that sucks. Yeah, that's what my therapist told me. Yeah. And I'm like, and I had the same thought, like, but I appreciated the honesty yeah, so right? much. Yeah, right? Because if much. not, you're waiting for this and it's never Because you happen. said it. You said it like, I don't feel fine. Right. And that was it. I'm like, I'm working. I'm taking care yeah. of my kids. We're getting, we're, we're setting goals. We're doing these things. We're like, people are like, it'll get better. I'm like, it's getting worse. Like, yeah. <laughs> but some like, parts do. But my therapist told me a similar thing. And it's, that's, that's the acceptance part that's hard. Like, you have to accept that. And then once this you is a do, new reality. Yeah. Then you can, you do start getting a little better. Yeah. You do. Yes. Once you accept yes. the fact that you won't, then yes. you do. <laughs> the old you is gone. And you're like, wait, there's a, a newer version, and in some parts, it's better, yeah. but it's just different. And it comes with this ugly memory. Yeah, I wish right? I could take the good lessons I've learned from the terrible thing and then go back. But right, that's and be just, better then. That's just not how it right? works. So, no. And so as we're going through this, and we're walking these dogs, and that helped lift that depression, which was the ironic thing. And I'm like, I teach this. What's the number one script for depression? Go out for a walk every day. Sunlight, get out in nature. Get out, yeah. Not running but, hard, doing the. I'm like, I'm plus the dog. Are you going to take care of? Yeah, a and bit, the dogs you love you. Yeah, and it was key for my little kid. We'd gotten him to where he could cry again and liked his favorite things and all the signs of PTSD in kids, which is different than adults. It's totally different. Yeah, learn so much, and just watching him be loving and cuddly and oh my gosh, as a teenager, that dog's still his favorite thing. Goes mm. up in his room every morning. Right, it's just it's cute, but. We watched this, and as it was, you know, it lifts, and I'm like, I'm an idiot. No, die. I should have done this two years sooner. Who cared how crazy life was? But um, my kids, we talk, and we would, we would talk about a lot of stuff every day, but we would talk about our situation. So, and they would so good. talk about their feelings, and they would talk about what would happen. And just as they needed to talk about it, and I would answer questions or encourage or do things. And one time, I was, I was walking with my son, Cooper, and he's older, and I had, I'm like, Cooper, I still hold on. I didn't stop this. I didn't fix this. This is partially our fault. I had something where it said stop. If I would have gone back and stopped and checked, would you have stayed in? Would you have not gotten injected? Would your helmet stayed on? And I did. I mean, and he goes, Mom, I'm okay. It's fine. You're good. And he suffered so much with therapy on his arm and having to get it move and reconstruction on his face and not being able to do anything at recess in elementary school for years of risk of hitting his head and not having this function and worried about ripping the new nerves out. And from lots of friends to no friends, being ostracized for years, you know, kids be kind of nice, but not. And dealing with the brain injury and the speech therapy and relearning how to do a whole bunch of stuff. He suffered and he's telling me, Mom, I'm fine. I'm good. And I just go, okay. And like, but. And all of a sudden, that trying to, if I would have, could have, should have, quieted down. But like, again, talking about it, like, if right. you never would have told him that, you never would have got that feedback. Right. And we still talk as he's 18 and a senior and getting ready to move on. I was going to ask, how's, how's he doing? Good. You know, the best thing, he's had so many IQ tests. 
He was eight years old. He had a five-year-old level of functioning when we walked out of the hospital. Oh, wow. It was rough. He had to relearn all of his vocabulary. He was speaking full sentences at one years old. It was really weird. I had a video, Daddy, where are you? I'm like, you're possessed. You're supposed to be like, Dad, Dad, Mama. Right. To we're playing I Spot It, and it's Pink Pig on both cards, you know? And he's like, I do not know. And we're sitting there for five minutes, and do you see that? Uh-huh. What is that? I do not know. I'm like, you've known a pig since you are one and a half years old. Like, yeah. heart sinking, right? Like, just... Oh, um, they retest him. His IQ is about a 130. He, you know, he has one English deficit. He had severe aphasia, had to relearn all of his vocabulary, word associations. He was in DLI Chinese. That didn't get affected. He spoke Chinese fine. I'm like, well, that's not helpful. Yeah. <laughs> like, you got to speak yeah. English here. And now, you know, and he's 30 on his ACT. Okay, great. 30 English on is, his eight, Yeah, I science, 17. math is clear up here. English down here. It pulls him down. I'm like, you're fine. You'll be fine. What are what are some of his hobbies? What does he like to do? Um, so we reworked. We got a special brace made because we mountain biked. He was doing black diamond trails when he was eight. No. We raced, right? So cool. We got a we got this huge fat tire tandem mountain bike. We still have it. It's a spectacle. We took it to Moab. We we're going tandem through these things. Oh, so bike. hard. But he he was on the back, so he could still do it. Then when he was ready for his bike, we got a brace made that has this big shock. We went to the you know custom whatever, a mm. couple grand. So he could ride his own mountain bike, relearn how to figure out riding basically with one arm and a grip. Fearless. Then we started him back on a motorcycle. Love it. Can you believe that? He rides dirt bikes. He can fly up stuff. We ride dirt bikes now. You can jump that off that. It can go off the cliff. You go on the so side. I, I mean, because like, dirt bikes are so dangerous. Like, who would let their kid ride a dirt bike? I'm just joking. Blue rides a dirt bike all the time. <laughs> but how do you explain that? Like, tragic accident. You're, you're just not scared of dirt bikes? How do you explain that one to My people? parents, I have to thank them. They, anytime something happens to us, you get back on. You get back on. Yeah. You get over it. You're not the victim. You don't feel sorry for you yourself. Life up. isn't fair. Yeah. We had all those lessons just drilled into us. And so we just, when he couldn't walk to the bathroom and back after a brain injury, walking down the hall was super hard. We hiked Temp from the time he was two and a half with my dad, little Temp Cave, and he wanted to do Temp Mountain. And I was like, all right. So we set goals. And that summer, amongst everything, we just walked further until we walked to Temp Cave. And then the next summer, we hiked to the top of Temp and back with a little backpack on till when we went backpacking in the Wind Rivers. And we just kept setting goals. And then we took him to Kilimanjaro. Hiked Kilimanjaro. No he has this, I mean, it's. I think it's how you approach it. What can you do? What can you not do? We can set goals and move forward. Or we can, yes, that grief grabs you and it wants to hold you back. And the thoughts and the sorrow of what you had done, you can feel sorry for yourself all you want. But And he's going to therapy and he's crying because he wants to be playing. He doesn't want to be doing this. We're taking him to NeuroWorks to try and retrain the, these breathing nerves to move his arm and, and all this. And he's in the car. And I'm trying to teach an eight-year-old perspective, eight, nine-year-old perspective. And so I'm showing him people with one arm and no arms and, you know, trying to pull up all these little video clips on YouTube. Like, he can do it. You can do it. He can do it. You can do it. And so many times I sat in the car. I said, listen, Cooper, I can't do the therapy for you. I wish I could. I wish I could trade you spots. Believe me, everything in me wanted to trade you spots. But I can take you. I can give you all the opportunities to get better. That's but the you have to yeah. do the work. Yeah. And time is going to go by, whether you want it, whether you know it or not, it's going to go by. Every day it's going to go by. And you can either be better or you can be the same. You have to decide. Do you want this three years down the road or do you want to be better three years down the road? So is that, because I was going to ask you, because Blue, he survived mm -hmm. the car accident. Yeah. What advice you have for me with him? But maybe that's it. Maybe you just. Set goals. Yeah, what does Blue want to do? What do you want to do with Blue? Yeah. And you start working at those goals. And it's a thing that we had goals every day. Every day we were working on something. We stuck him in piano. His two fingers didn't work. The nerves here. His bicep innervated on its own. And the doctor stepped back and said, 5% of the population will do that. We don't know. Yeah. The two fingers who want to do piano, they didn't work. We stuck him in piano. He worked through the frustration. Those fingers work. He has all of his motor dexterity. And so we just, we kept setting little goals. He still has nerve, nerve growth going and they, we got tested. He had this question. We went and got tested in the fall and the guy said, that should have been done years ago. I can't explain what's going on. So Cooper, oh. you just keep working these muscles. And when your brain decides it needs it, you know, stuff's happening. His pec muscle is about the size of a pinky, but there's pec muscle coming. Yeah. Right. And so we've just set, here's what you want to do. Here's what you're going to do. He had to play tennis. He couldn't play contact sports. Anymore. Yeah. It took three years to learn how to throw a ball up with his left hand Man. to be able to hit a serve. But you just keep at the it. The page, like the 
patience and yeah. every day. You just, yeah. I think uh, one thing one thing that me and Blue do a good job of is we talk about them a lot, mm-hmm. which I think is very healthy for him. And then we love to do hard things. That's yeah. just something we tell each other. So if he ever says anything like, this is hard, I'm like, good, we love to do hard yeah. things. Like we just encourage that. Yes. And we don't really talk about failure or success that much, but no. we just – just tr- give it a go. Just try. Yeah. Work at it till you can get it. Yeah. It might take years. And I do, I mean, yeah. I do think grief's like everything else. It just, it takes practice and you got to put the yeah. time in. You yep. can't run away from it. You got to no. feel it. You got to, you got to talk about it. All those yep. things. And you do have to let yourself feel it. I did stop by my parents' graves a couple of times. One time by myself, usually with my kids, just driving back, whatever. I just decided to turn. They're buried in Orem. Mm-hmm. And that's where we lived when I was first little. And I had a little baby brother, born super early, lived a few hours, died. That's where the grave. And so I'm like, we'll, we'll bury him there. And I pulled over. I sat down. And I lost it. But there was nobody there. There was no kids to try and look tough for. There was yeah, no whatever. Just... And a couple of times I've done that over the years. But it's because I know, you know, you're so worried about raising your son. You can't experience grief like a person by themselves could. Right. Right, but it's also a good focus too to keep. I was you about going. to say that's kind mm-hmm. of like a good and bad thing. Yeah, if alien from another planet who's never experienced grief ever in his life comes up to you, <laughs> I know that's a weird way to <laughs> phrase this question. But comes up to you, he's like, "What's grief? Like, what is it? What are you saying? Like, oh. how would you explain it?" It's a range of emotions you couldn't even imagine. It's it like you really. Can it? You have to just be in it. Yeah, to really you can't know. imagine it. And then you know, as you look over, like I said, in Moab, looking over the cliff, I can't even imagine. You can't, and then you can. And all of a sudden, you look at people differently. You look at people where you've heard stories differently. All of a sudden, you have an insight. You have a window. You're in this club you didn't really want to be in. But it, I think it just changed my view towards people in general, and what they've gone through, and how many people have gone through something you just don't know, you have and no just, idea. just. Changes you. I mean, and that many, part changes you for the better. How many of the students you teach have any idea about what you've been through? Probably, or I don't know. We ta- I talk or about it talk when about, we talk oh, about grief now. I, I said, I'm going to tell you a story and there are faces. That is, I summarize it. But these, I said, that is so cool. But it's it's good for them because I'm a storyteller it's when I teach. It's beyond good for them. But I said, but here's how you get through it. How long? You are going to have these things happen to you at some point. Yeah. We don't get out of here not dying, right? That's so cool. We don't do get out of here. We celebrate coming in. And we farewell going out, but we don't get to choose. Yeah. And at some point, it's going to happen. And we Man, talk about, I, think of when your pet died when you were a kid for someone. Right. They're like, oh, we're sobbing. And yeah. That's just a little, That's little just, snippet. Just, yeah. This is going to be your whole life, actually. People. Yeah. And I think what people, what I try and tell my students, and I've had students who've experienced things, um, but then I just want to go and hug them. I'm like, I'm here. I get it. Right? Because when you lose your parents... In my perspective, and when I've talked to some of the people about their parents, you lose those people who are there for you no matter what. Yeah. As much as you screw up, like they're the un- there for you. They're those, are, those are the unconditional love they're the people. unconditional one. They're the ones that have your back. And that safety net is gone. And I think that was really hard for me to come to. Because when you're married and your spouse, they're there, but it's somewhat conditional. Right. You can screw yeah. that up. Yeah. Right? You can screw that up. For sure. And you have your kids, but you're the one there for them. Right. But those people, and I wasn't ready for that. I never learned that in a textbook. And for some people, I know it's not that way. They don't have great relationships. That's not how they feel. But I think for majority, that's our safety net. That's our backup. Yeah. That's our people in the world who still care about us no matter what happens. And that was a weird state to be in. That was that one was really hard for me to kind of come to terms with. It was a little scary to think if something happens to me, who's gonna care? There's nobody there. Yeah. Right. And that would that one I'm over that. You know, you, you come to terms, there's people and yeah, you'll be fine, like you'll figure it out. But it was weird. It was weird to experience your worst thing, but then to have the people who have your back the most not be there with you. And that was hard. Yeah. yeah. I get that feeling with like when I try to grieve over Courtney, mm-hmm. when I don't want my kids to do it. Or when I try to grieve over my kids, when I don't want my wife. It's like, yeah, you're right. missing you're missing the person who cares about your kids as yeah. much as you do is not right. there. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's um, hard. Anything else you want to touch on or say before we get into 
top three favorite. We haven't really talked about your 90%. Oh, the I mean, 90% is just that choice every day. You know, when it was the worst of the worst, and there was t- literally there's times I can go back and think of literally that you wanted to sit down and tap out. God, this is too much. I don't know how, like, I think everyone has that. Yeah. I don't no matter. I don't care who you are. You have those moments of yeah, just utter. Yeah. No. Done. Right? Done. And you pick yourself back up. I have a lot of point. those moments a few times of, I don't even know. But I have those moments. Do they get fewer and fewer? Yeah. They get fewer. And they have for me, I guess, if I think about it. They yeah. Have. Ten years down, they get much fewer. It doesn't mean they don't still come up. Occasionally, one holiday, all of a sudden, it's real crappy. Yeah, grief's like you've been born with these grief baby legs, and you're trying to yeah. learn how to walk. Like, yeah. You're just trying to, yeah, you're yeah. trying to figure this out. And grief, there's so much in common with grief. Mm-hmm. Like, having a podcast has shown me that. Like, so many things that everyone says is a lot of it's similar. Yeah. And how they cope with it's similar. But it's also very different. Yeah. Lots of differences for how people handle that grief, which is fair. But I, I kind of want to ask you one more question. Like, because if we just say everyone handles grief differently, which is true, but if we just throw that out there, we're kind of creating a problem. Like, we you, are. You can just do whatever you want. Because you can't, because you won't get through it. I yeah, like, think. this is how I handle my grief. Well, like, no, that's... No, I think it's looking for yeah. the, those, those little golden nuggets, those things every day. And we teach that in psychology. What are yeah. the three good things today, regardless of how crappy it was? Regardless of how crappy that day was, regardless, I watched the people I care about most die. Mm. Beautiful sunrise, great time with them, right? Or like my situation. People came to help. Like a lot of people don't have a wife or kids. It's just something they don't even get ever. So like, wow, at least I had them and those experiences. Yeah, and I never never did that. I know people do. I never did that. I never did. Well, at least I. I do look at, well, at least I have good memories and I miss them because I had such a great relationship with them. I yeah. do do that, right? If it wasn't, you'd be like, huh, right? Yeah. It'd be easy to move on. Right. But I looked for days. I look, I got up and watched the sunrise and I watched the sunset. Whatever I was doing, those were key. Why does, and I don't know if this is true for yeah. everyone, but like my grief completely changed my relationship with Mother Earth, nature. Mm-hmm. Totally. Used to, I used to be all about basketball and inside, mm-hmm. and then like didn't care for a sunset really, or, or yeah. I'd look at it like, okay. Yeah, or, nice. And now, like, oh, it's eight thirty. Like, we better, we, we gotta yeah. go outside on a walk, mm-hmm. watch the sun. Like, we, it's mm-hmm. why I don't know what it is about grief and this connection to Earth, but it is real. It is. And most people I've talked to have the same thing, like this yeah. connection. To earth again yeah really helps them and i thought is it because it's the start of a new day no bad day ever lasts forever it's the close of a day you made it different thoughts would go through my head probably because my parents we would watch and my dad taught me to love that kind of stuff but for whatever it was those were key for years yeah and then i would just look at what i was grateful for that day what was good that day where did somebody help i tried to keep that look at the positive yeah every think, single day speaking of golden nuggets that you bring mm-hmm. up about within the trauma i think being in the moment, it, that's a golden nugget I've gotten yeah. from what I've experienced is, wow, really appreciating today, like you've just said. And I used to think death was, in the future, something that I'll see later when I'm old, yeah, in the hospital bed, comfy, yeah. with all the loved ones around, yeah. just per- picture-perfect yeah. death <laughs> yeah. going out. And then I learned, like, oh, like, death is breathing on the back of my neck. Yeah. Like Any 10 moment. seconds ago is now dead, done, never getting it back. And so now I look at days as I go to sleep, I die. I wake up, I'm born, and you have today. No. And you might not have another day. there's no day. guarantee. Yeah, this might be your last one. Yeah. And that has really helped me handle my grief in waves. It's like, okay, we have yeah. today. What are we going to do with today? Are we going to just yeah. complain and whine and cry in bed all day? Is that what we're going to do? But that perspective has really helped me appreciate and to be in the moment is you're born every day and you die every day. And not live in that past. That and not awful. live in that in that past. I had a, a key moment when we were in primary children's. We're there and um, in the PICU, they have the PICU and, and they have the room for families to go to and people donate meals and they come and there's food and you, there's recliners with this amazing view of the valley for parents to just kind of get away or to just not have to go down the cafeteria and stuff. And 
after a few days, my husband's like, you need to go eat. We'll take turns because someone always had to be with my son. And so he's sitting in there and I wander down and I'm like, oh, you know, you didn't eat a lot. You didn't, right? There's just, you know. The, the little things you kind of forget about. That. You just don't even care. You don't <laughs> it's care. You so just don't true. even care, right? You yeah, don't even like, care. And I forced myself to get ready every day. I didn't try and look like a slop, right? There was things my parents ingrained in me, but there's stuff I just didn't care about. Yeah. Didn't care about racing. Didn't care about eating. Didn't care about all this stuff. Yeah, because it's like, because I don't know if this is how it was yeah. for you, but before the accident, like, oh, like, you might lose. And now you're like, who cares no. if, who Training cares? And doing this and <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I mean, I had my kids a brown racing schedule. I had them in October, get oh, shape race again. I had raced Ironman after my last, all right, we're ready for this. And I'm like, I don't care. And that's still, you know, I just, that competitive side, that drive, you know, in athletics, it's like, that's fine. I mean, right. I don't want to get fat. I want to stay in shape, but I don't care about the other stuff. Right. But I'm sitting there and I sit with these three other parents. We're sitting at this table. Everyone has the same look. It's not a happy, right? Everyone sits down. Someone starts talking, well, where are you here? What's going on? And they go around the table. The man sitting across from me, they go around. He speaks. And I'm the last one. He goes, oh, I'm here. My eight-year-old son has a heart condition. We thought he was going to get a transplant, but then it didn't happen. No way. Guess who they were waiting You're for? You're kidding. As I sat there and it dawned on me, and I looked at him. And I said, my eight-year-old son came in on Sunday. And he looked, and it was Cooper. And he's like, I'm so glad you got your miracle. Mike, I'm sorry you haven't gotten yours. What do you do? One guy's praying for that heart, but not praying for someone to have a tragedy. And right there, as we stayed those days and we would walk floors and we had to cut short and we'd come down the cancer unit, a girl came in next to me. We told Cooper's story the next year at the school for Charity Month with the yeah. girl who came in next to me. She was brain dead. She had drowned. She'd been underwater for 15 minutes. They resuscitated her. I watched the scan. I listened to her mom, had a beautiful voice, and was singing to her. And I was like, you don't get it. She walked out of there. She came through. They can't describe it. It's such a different sense. I think that's why I never had the poor me feel sorry for me. Why this happened to me? I'm like, shit happens to everybody at yeah. some point. Good, bad, young old. I mean, doesn't take matter. mine, take another. I'm not going to complain. And I think that kind of set a tone to look for those things and help. If I look back, there's so many things that help set a tone to either go one way or the other, and it just matters which way you pick as you go through this journey. To final acceptance, painting over a wall my mom helped me paint years ago in the last room of our house. And I wondered why I fought it and fought it and fought it. I painted it this year, 10 years later. Right? Closure. 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 Right? I think my, my, I, I think God is us, humanity, together. Yeah. Your story of Your, that story you just told, that is like, mm -hmm. that's God. That's yeah, that is pure love, and that's probably the best word. But like, that is be that is. <sighs> I've learned God is the people. He's not here right now. He's here, not here. But yeah. he's the people that have come along the way. And I could go through miracle, mir little people put in the way that chose to become who they needed to become to help us. Chose to be a rescuer, yeah. be the neurosurgeon who used Dr. Mahan, was in the twin, down working by the Twin Towers when 9-11 happened. Investment banker, whatever, decided what he did didn't make a difference. Went back to medical school for the next 10 years to be a neurosurgeon. To be one of the few that grafts nerves, moved here a week after my son got hurt. His arm wouldn't move. Right. I can go back through all of these different people that stepped in along the way. And I don't say, no, people, you're right. People are God's hands. That was, yeah. That, they are the ones who step in. To have that perspective, to have that moment with each other, to say, I'm I'm sorry I didn't get your miracle. I'm, I'm glad you got your, like. Right. To understand what that means for him and his kid, that is just. You don't want someone's kid to die for your kid to live, but that's no. their reality. I right. can't imagine being him. I and, can't. And I remember uh, Ryan, we interviewed Ryan Stream, and he told me, he's like, Mace, if you had to pass your story to someone else, who would you give it to? I'm like, 
Nobody. Well, no one. Nobody. And that, like, that hit me hard. Mm-hmm. Like, wow. Like, thank you, man. Yeah. Um, but we're good. Ten years later, we're good. Yeah, I'm sure you're good. Different, but good. Right? Would I do yeah. it all over again if I had to do it? Absolutely, for my kid. Absolutely. Yeah. I don't want to, but I would. And I think that's where we come down to. We don't want to, yeah. but we will. That's the commitment we made to our kids. And I don't know why this story popped in my head mm-hmm. when you were talking, but you were talking about people making a difference or not or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I remember I was a little kid and my mom told me this story. I think it was like a news article or something. She's like, Mace, I heard this story. This guy, he's on the beach and a bunch of starfish get washed oh, yeah. up. On, yeah. Oh, do you know where I'm going with it? Yeah. yeah. Beautiful story. Yeah. It's like hundreds of starfish are on yeah. the beach. And this guy's on the beach picking them up and taught, like tucking them back in the ocean, like saving all these starfish. Yeah. And this guy comes up to him. He's like, dude, like, what are you doing? Like, there's thousands of starfish. Yeah. You're getting, they're, they're already dead or they're, they're not going to save any amount worth saving. Right. And he's like, well, I made a difference to this one. And yep. he hucks that one and then yep. picks up another one. I made a difference. And he just keeps talking. And that is you. That's yeah. the 1090 podcast right. is most people aren't going to give a shit or know or listen. But some somebody might. This starfish. Somebody and might. this one will. And you know how long it took me to come in here? We talked a few months ago. Yeah, I, I didn't know if you wanted me to bring that up, but like, no, I kept kind of putting it off you. because somewhere in my head, I'm like, it's over. Move on, move on, move on. It's just part of you, yeah. And it's there for a reason, and it does help. And when we, my husband and I were in Thailand a few months ago, and we were motorcycle riding through Thailand, ironically, with two of these search and rescue guys. No, we become friends with them, right? We people tried to give us money. We went and gave it to them. Cooper did his Eagle Scout project for him. He raised seventeen thousand dollars. Got yeah. motorcycle rope yeah. stuff. Stuff so fun to help give back because they do so much for you. But we've become good friends with a couple of them, so we end up going to Thailand. And one of them is one we worked with search and rescue. He wasn't there that day, but one of the guys is the guys that was there that day. And we're sitting on this beautiful street in this little town, enjoying our avocado smoothies in Thailand. Beautiful weather. And they said, "Do you mind if we ask what happened that day?" Because we've never really known. And I'm like, well, sure. I would. There's nothing I wouldn't do for these guys. You have such a devotion for somebody who helps you in a moment. Yeah, like you that, guys right? share that moment. That was a that was a make it or break of that day. These guys who give their time, training, yeah. efforts, and just care so much. And so as we're telling the story, and I'm getting teary eyed, like trying to talk to them. One guy nailed me. He's like, "We come down and talk to our youth." I think I'm like, "Oh," I said, "I'd do anything for you." I'm like. So I went down and I talked to these youth and I'm talking to them and half of them have this horrified look because I'm telling yeah. the story and I'm like, are you sure this look. is a good idea? Yeah. I think I just terrorized them. <laughs> They're never stepping out of their house again. And at the end of this story, I had these little heart rocks. I was giving them to them. If just be the person to make a difference. Be that person who can step in whatever it is, right? Be God's hands. And this man comes up to me that our friend had come and listen who had lost his son 14 years ago in a motorcycle accident. He was there. He didn't die right away. It's a horrific kind of story, right? Traumatic. And the man looked at me, and he just broke down crying. How have you gotten through this? And I talked to him. And then it hit me. I'm like, all right, I'll I'll contact Mason. Because what you do, you don't know, just like you said. And I'm like, all right, I'll tell the story, because maybe it will help that one person. It feels like they can't do it. They're on that edge that we've been at where you want to tap out to say, no, horrible things happen. But guess what? You can get through it. You can get through it. No, many starfish are going to be helped with your story for sure. Um, Movies? Are we ready for movies? Oh, movies. Or or we said everything. (laughs) And that's a funny question. Good thing you prepped me because I'm like, what movies do I like? And, you know, I like lots of different kinds of movies. And they're weird favorites. Teaching sports psychology. Yeah. Remember the Titans? Oh. Right? Yes. Miracle. <laughs> yep. Two of my favorite. We show them every year. It's application-based. I love those movies. Never get sick of watching them when I show them. And I go back to like things like Shawshank Redemption. I'm like, these are kind of yeah. dark. That one's a little dark. That, uh, Shawshank. That was classic. Right? And I'm like, why do I like these? And so I started thinking about it because my kids, we, you know, trying to give my kids perspective. Listen to Boys in the Boat. I teach that to my 
you That's know, to my good. student cover kids Same and unbroken. Woman. And when the movie came out this year, I was so excited. I'm like, you did it. And just, no, this is not the book. <laughs> it doesn't show. And I thought, you know, it doesn't show why these people were so strong. You know, we watch these movies. We watch these people who do great things. It's because they don't give up. Regardless of what movie we pick or what the circumstances are in these movies, and these are all stories, they don't give up. When I'm thinking, I'm like, that's ironic. You're 1090 and everything. What's the thing that changes how we get through anything? And it's not a situation. We all get crappy situations. Yeah. You find out how to get through it, how to overcome it, and you don't give up. And I think those are the movies I like. You don't give up. You figure out a way. Yeah, I think someone asked me on a podcast, and I was like, "What? Like, what's the point of all this? Like, what's the point of life?" You think? And I'm like, I don't think anyone knows, but I think not. I think. Not giving up, just yeah. seeing it through. Finish the race. It's like a race. And Finish it. Yeah, I think that's got to be high on the list at least. And th- yeah, remember the Titan, all those movies you listed. No. Do a great job of that. They're great. And you don't give up. I mean, you just you just set new things to look forward to. You just keep going. You find, you find reasons. Yeah, I think the reason I love Never Giving Up is that, that it's in your control. Right. That's something you own. Right. That's up to you. Yeah. No one can take that away as bad as it is. Like, And do you think it's sports that taught us? Yeah. That or like the Victor somebody. Frankel guy? No. Yeah. That guy. Oh, man. His book. Yeah. Never give up. No. Um, your inspiration. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, you're welcome. You're, Thanks for being patient. How long? How much longer are you going to keep teaching? I have five more years. I'm telling oh, you. Oh, uh, you got the timer <laughs> clicking down. <laughs> you're timer good. Timer clicking. It's all, I mean, as you know, it's all, it's not an easy job. I love my students though. Yeah. I love my students. And probably as long as I think they care and they, you know, I think something. it's so cool you share it with them. That's so cool. Oh yeah. We so tell powerful. them all sorts of stories because how else do you gain perspective? And that's what I learned working with my kid. This is how you gain perspective. You hear people's stories. Well, like, and you want to build a relationship with your students yeah. to teach them and opening up. That's like the best way to do it. Yeah. And I was just talking to my therapist. I'm like, dude, the reason you got me to open up because you opened up. Mm-hmm. And I th- I think that's just a yeah. powerful thing. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. Life's 10% what happens to you and 90% what you're going to do about it.